I was just noticing how uh, my title when I show that is clipped off. <coughs> I'm wondering if that'll be, we'll have to see if that happens with my other slides. Okay. Be warned, let me know if something's missing off the uh, side of the uh, slide. Uh, it's great to be able to talk to uh, all of you, and uh, uh, it's especially great to talk here just because so much of our research is done in the Santa Barbara Channel, and the Naturalist Corps and the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary are such important contributors and uh, key partners uh, to our work. I guess I should talk into the microphone here. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, and those of you coming in, if there's, uh, there is still, I know, more room up in front, if people want to stand uh, on the side, feel free to, to move up if it gets uh, kind of packed in there. Uh, so I, I do want to, uh, I'll probably want to go pretty quickly through some of these uh, because um, uh, what I want to talk about is a number of different things. I've got this slated to talk first about an update on uh, some of the whales that we have around here and some unusual findings that have come up in the region uh, with different whales. I want to talk about the ship strike impact and then I want to talk about this behavioral response study that we began doing uh, last year. Uh, so the, the two species I'm talking about long-term studies that have uh, started with work down here in the late 80s and early 1990s are on humpback and blue whales. Uh, these are both large baleen whale species. They're uh, two of the most common whales that feed in the Santa Barbara Channel and the Southern California Bight. Uh, both of them heavily hunted uh, as recently as 1966 by commercial whalers off the U.S. coast. So we had a whaling station operating out of San Francisco Bay uh, based out of Oakland that hunted both humpback and blue whales through the mid-1960s. So within the lifetime of these animals, they were subjected to pressure uh, from whaler whaling on our coast. Uh, and the first uh, slide kind of gets at uh, the good news that's happened since then. This is the long-term trend data we've been able to get from, our, from these studies of humpback whales. And by using these fluke identification photographs, we're able to use a procedure called mark recapture, which looks at uh, the reciting rate of these identified animals and lets us extrapolate the size of the population. And just in the period that we've studied these animals, which this graph goes from 1990 uh, to 2009 on the right, and each of these is our annual estimate of how many humpback whales there were. And in, I think this is green, right? Green? I'm partially colorblind. Uh, this is how many different individuals we identified each year of humpback whales. And we typically identify somewhere between two and 400 humpback whales each year, though you'll see in 2009 we actually got over almost 500 different animals were identified. And then this is our curve uh, in, the, in the diamonds in blue are our actual annual estimates of how many humpback whales there are. And then the curve shows the model that we, what all of those points add up to for what it says the trend is. And it basically goes from 500 animals here at, in 1990 uh, to almost 2,000 animals by the end. And you'll see something else that's happening. <clears throat> These little bars show how confident we are of the estimate. And because the population has grown, and yet our sample size has stayed generally fairly steady, uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, kind of byproducts of that is that as the population grows, we have greater and greater uncertainty in our abundance estimate. So you actually see those bars are getting bigger at the end, and you also see this line is starting to fluctuate quite a bit. Uh, and that's just a product of the fact we're getting fewer matches between our samples as that population <coughs> grows. And we either need to increase our sample size or just accept there's more noise in our estimate. But especially in these early years, we had really uh, good confidence. And this curve translates to a 7.5% per year increase. Uh, and that doesn't sound like much, but just in the period from 1990 through 2009, that has resulted in almost a fourfold increase in the humpback whale population. Uh, so it has been doing fairly well. We don't know exactly where it's headed, uh, but we're, we think we're probably getting close to carrying capacity now. Uh, <clears throat> and that's based on some very rough estimates of how many whales were killed and estimates of how many were there at the start of whaling 
and that's our best guess of what this population will likely expand to. Uh, so we're not quite there, but you know, you'll see the very last data point we have is actually a drop, but again, that could just be noise. It, I it would have to get another year or two of that before I believed would actually leveled off from this increase. Right now, I think that just looks like part of this noise that's in the end. But it's pretty good news with humpbacks <laughs> overall. Uh, and I'm going to show you the pattern with blue whales. Um, uh, and then I'm going to return to humpbacks and show you what, how this fits in kind of across the North Pacific. But I did want to show this first. Uh, those of you who have heard me talk in past years, you would have seen the first part of this curve. And, and this is really the same data, except now there's one more data point at the end of it. Um, now, blue whales are a different story. And, and this is maybe a little bit more troubling. And I've put on here three, three different uh, trends of data we have with blue whales that tell us slightly different stories. This again goes from 1990 on the left to 2010 on the right. And these are estimates of abundance, again, based on mark recapture, 1,000, 2,000. And you'll see that in the 1990s, <clears throat> uh, we were getting two different methods that were agreeing on an abundance of blue whales off the US West Coast of about 2,000 animals. And the two methods are in squares and in blue uh, is our mark recapture estimate that is obtained when uh, not just when we do our coastal surveys, but we've only estimated it there when there was also an offshore survey that let us estimate the number and the identities of blue whales that were in waters out to 300 miles offshore. Uh, and down below here, this is a mark recapture estimate using only our coastal surveys. And it's good because we can get data every year, but we know it's missing a lot of blue whales. But I show it here because this might be an indicator of a trend. It's more accurate data and it has more data points. So I show this one to show the trend. <clears throat> and finally, our third method I'm going to introduce is a, a method that's used by Southwest Fisheries Science Center. And they're part of NOAA. And they, every three to five years, do a survey up and down the West Coast in a ship. And they count blue whales as they do that survey using a method called line transect. And the basic goal of that technique is to estimate the density <coughs> of blue whales. So they don't end up counting very many blue whales, but they can extrapolate the rate at which they're seeing blue whales by doing these surveys very systematically. They can extrapolate it out and come up with, a, and, and it, rather than being a population estimate, it's an estimate of the average number of blue whales present in the summer and fall off the US West Coast, which is when they do these surveys. They do them in the summer and fall. And you'll see that we had great agreement in these estimates. They were coming up with estimates of about 2,000 blue whales using the West Coast, mostly off California. And we were using mark recapture and photo ID and coming up with very similar estimates. <clears throat> and then they've diverged. Uh, these line transect estimates, they did three surveys in the 1990s. And they've done three surveys in the 10 years, the most recent 10 years since then. And whereas their three estimates were close to 2000 in the 1990s, they're, all their estimates in the last 10 years have been about five to 600 animals. So they showed a rather precipitous decline in the number of blue whales that were occurring off the US West Coast. And meanwhile, we were showing a pretty steady estimate in our unbiased mark recapture and possibly an increasing uh, estimate from what I will call our trend counts. So the discrepancy between that uh, caused us to scratch our heads a little bit. And what we discovered was that, uh, and uh, this is something that's in a paper you can download on our website that we published last year. Uh, what we concluded is that uh, blue whales, the blue whale population is accurately reflected by our mark recapture estimate. So we still think it is staying at about 2,000. It's growing nowhere near the rate that humpbacks are. It's stable, possibly increasing slightly. But what's happened in the last 10 years is the blue whales, whereas in the 1990s, they were spending all of the summer and fall off the US West Coast feeding, so they would be caught by these line transect surveys. In the last 10 years, they've only been spending part of the time off the US West Coast. And since 
Our estimate estimates the population. That shows it's steady. Their estimate estimates how many are present at any single moment in time. Theirs shows a decline and ours doesn't. And we found support for this in a couple of different things. <clears throat> First of all, in uh, starting around uh, 1999 and 2000, there were changes in oceanographic conditions off California, and krill abundance was much less plentiful. The humpback whales that we studied, we found switched from feeding primarily on krill to feeding on fish. And many of the seabirds that were dependent on krill, like Cassin's Auklets and areas like the Farallon Islands, uh, <clears throat> were having much greater problems. Uh, so we had a couple of indicators that krill abundance had declined. And what we suspect is that that created a less favorable environment for the blue whales that are exclusively krill feeders. They can't switch to fish like the humpbacks have. <coughs> the other indicator we had that supported this uh, was that blue whales used to be hunted and used to be considered abundant off British Columbia and up in the Gulf of Alaska. And in the 1990s, no one was seeing blue whales up there. And then starting in the 2000s, they began seeing blue whales. And in fact, in one survey, in one day off the Queen Charlotte Islands that I did, I found five blue whales. And of the blue whales we were seeing up in the Gulf of Alaska and British Columbia, <clears throat> the majority of them we could match by photo ID to the whales that had been off California. So we knew they were the same whales. So anyway, that's why we put this together. But <clears throat> I tell you all of this because this is still, I would still say this, and we present this as you know, what we think is happening. But I still have to treat this downward decline in how many blue whales we've had off California as a concern. We think we know what's going on and we think the population's doing okay, and it's just shifted into spending only part of the time here. But that's still, I think, something we need to be aware of as possibly a problem. And even with our mark recapture abundance, clearly blue whales are not recovering like humpbacks are at the same rate. We're not seeing those kind of 7.5% rates of increase and fourfold increases in the same time period. We're, we're just not seeing that with blue whales. So, a little bit more concerned about what's going on with blue whales. And again, here's just contrasting those two, you know, this almost fourfold increase in blue in humpback whales on top, you know, and this steady uh, estimate, possibly an increase by mark recapture and evidence for a decrease by this en estimate of density. <clears throat> okay, so I said I would get back just to splash, and many of you have seen the splash results because this was a study done in the mid-2000s, but I wanted to just recap it briefly. This was a study that used blue, a humpback whale photo identification to track movements of humpbacks across the whole North Pacific. And for example, this actually connects the re-sightings of humpbacks between breeding and feeding areas in the splash study. <clears throat> and all of these lines connect the re-sighting of the same whale. Uh, and what it ended up revealing was that humpback whales actually engage in a far more complicated pattern of migrations and movements in the North Pacific than we'd anticipated. And I'll just highlight the ones that are most relevant to us here because it does tell a story that's relevant to the whales out here. Off Central America turns out to be a breeding area for humpback whales. <clears throat> and almost all of these whales exclusively come to the U.S. West Coast. We've never found one of these Central America whales using any other feeding area. And in fact, the highest proportion of them come here to the Southern California Bight. So that seems to be, and, and Central America was kind of a neat area because uh, <clears throat> in the older literature, it was not recognized as a major breeding area for humpbacks, but that in fact is one of the major breeding areas for the humpbacks that feed off here. Uh, and several people in the room have joined me at some of our expeditions we do down there uh, that have yielded these identifications to show us these migration patterns. It turns out that it's about 80 to 85 percent of the animals we identify off Central America are animals we know from California. So most of the animals we see there have already been identified here. <clears throat> In Mexico, it, it's much more complicated. You have a mainland breeding area uh, and those animals, and I think that's, is this like purple or something like that? I can't quite tell. Uh, a lot of those animals uh, go to the west coast as well, though they tend to disproportionately go a little bit further north, but you'll see some purple lines 
Some of them are coming out here into the Aleutians. But what's wild about Mexico is there's a set of offshore islands called the Rey Valledos. And these are shown in green. And a lot of those whales tend to go primarily to the Gulf of Alaska, and a few of them even coming all the way over here to Russia. So making some real unusual cross-Pacific movements. <coughs> Uh, and these Ray Vallejo animals show a migratory movement pattern that is actually much more similar to Hawaii than it is to mainland Mexico, even though they're not separated by that much. So Mexico is sort of an interesting case. Here you see the Hawaii whales. It was thought for a long time that the Hawaii whales mostly went to southeast Alaska, and that is one spot they go to. But they actually do fan out everywhere from British Columbia all the way around to the Aleutians and the Bering Sea. Uh, you can see no humpback whale matches between Hawaii and California. We know from our long-term work that occasionally a Hawaii humpback whale will make it over here, or you could say a California humpback whale will make it to Hawaii, whichever way you want to look at it. Uh, but it's, it's fairly unusual. Uh, most of our whales off the California coast are from either mainland Mexico or they're breeding in Central America. Okay. The estimates from this study did reveal that we had about 20,000 humpback whales in the North Pacific, which was about three times the estimate that anyone thought uh, was what humpback whales had recovered to. And that's why I say humpback whales look like in the North Pacific they may be approaching their pre-whaling numbers, because the pre-whaling estimates of abundance were of that magnitude. And I say that of that magnitude because <clears throat> there is not very good precision in estimating those pre-whaling humpback whale abundance. They're mostly based on how many whales were killed and have to work to kill the last whales to try to estimate. So if you have to work twice as hard to now kill the next whale, that means you've killed half of them. Uh, it's kind of that sort of catch per unit effort calculation. Uh, and it's fraught with problems because whalers change their behavior, whales change their behavior, and there was massive under-reporting and misreporting of whale catches all of which would lead to erroneous estimates of those pre-whaling numbers. OK. Uh, I just want to say that if we try to figure out what the trend for the whole North Pacific in humpback whales, you end up with figures pretty similar to what we have off the US West Coast. Of, uh, for the North Pacific, even if we go, like I'll just point out this bottom line. Dale Rice in 1966, at the very end of commercial whaling for humpbacks in the North Pacific, estimated there were 1,400 humpback whales left in the North Pacific. And if you take that 1,400 in 1966 and then look at <clears throat> what the population had reached for splash, it comes out at about a 7% per year increase. So that's, you know, they've come a long way back from a low of probably around 1,400 to now 20,000 or so. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, those of you who were here earlier, I made a brief mention. I want to just highlight a couple of new developments with whales. Uh, one new finding you may have seen in the news is uh, we have <coughs> a very healthy population of gray whales. Uh, it's gone through some ups and downs recent years that uh, have raised some concerns about its status, but it was removed from the endangered species list in the late 1990s. And that whale uh, population generally breeds in Mexican waters and migrates primarily up into the Bering and Chukchi and Arctic uh, to feed and numbers about 20,000. Uh, but there is a very small and highly endangered western gray whale population <clears throat> that occurs off Sakhalin Island uh, that is thought to number only 140 animals. And very recently, one of those animals was satellite tagged to look at what breeding area it went to. It was suspected that it would go to somewhere off China. And instead, the red track shows what that whale did. Uh, and it stopped transmitting just a little over a month ago. Uh, but it, instead of going down to China, it crossed the ocean, came over here to Washington, and was headed down the coast, and may well be off California or Mexico now as we speak. Uh, and this is sort of. Uh, <clears throat> left a lot of whale researchers scratching their heads because uh, this is an area where there's been a great deal of concern about this whale population and its survival. Uh, again, it, 